Welcome to Syntax, a Generative Introduction, 4th Edition. My name is Andrew Carney. I'm a professor of linguistics at the University of Arizona. I'm the author of your textbook, and I'll be leading you through this series of video tutorials. In the previous two units, we started to investigate the properties of binding theory, which is the relationships between nouns that are governed by structural relations. So certain nouns can appear in certain kinds of structural configurations, and others cannot. In the previous unit, we talked about anaphores. Anaphores are subject to principle A, which says that anaphores must find an antecedent, that means they must be bound, which is C commanded, and co-indexed within their binding domain. So they have to find an antecedent that they're linked to with an index that C commands it within the clause that contains them. Next we're going to look at pronouns, which interestingly have almost the reversed um, kind of relationship with their uh, possible antecedents from anaphores. Pronouns, you'll recall, are words like I, me, she, he, it, they, as well as the possessive pronouns, his, her, their, etc. Okay, let's look at the distribution of pronouns. Again, Heidi is going to be um, hitting herself on the head with a, with a vegetable. Um, uh, hi, my friend Heidi is quite fine with us using these sentences. Um, what we'll note about um, pronouns like her is so that when you say a sentence like Heidi bopped her on the head with a zucchini, the her has to refer to someone other than Heidi. So you'll notice that in the co-indexing in our first sentence, where Heidi bears the index I and her, um, her bears the index K, meaning they have to refer to different people. If you actually do co-index them, you get, an un, you get an unacceptable meaning. So Heidi bopped her on the head with a zucchini cannot mean Heidi bopped Heidi on the head with a zucchini. That's just an unacceptable um, interpretation of that sentence. We can contrast that right, with um, anaphores, which have the opposite distribution, right? So an anaphore in uh, the first sentence, Heidi bopped herself on the head with a zucchini, must be co-indexed and can't have a different index. So it's almost the opposite. Um, let's look at a case where the pronoun is in a different clause than um, the antecedent. And here we see uh, a surprising result, which is when the pronoun is in a different clause from its antecedent, you can have either interpretation. So you can have an interpretation where Heidi and she are co-referent. Heidi said that uh, she danced with art can mean Heidi said that Heidi danced with art, or it can refer to somebody else. Heidi said that she danced with art could refer to Diane or uh, Lucia or somebody like that. So it appears as if that in embedded clauses, pronouns are much freer in their reference than they are when they're in the same clause as their antecedent. It, it appears to be the case that the major restriction on pronouns is exhibited in sentence two. They can't be bound, so they can't have the same indexing as their antecedent and be co-indexed by the antecedent if they're in the same clause as the antecedent. In all the other three cases, which are acceptable, the pronoun um, does either doesn't have an antecedent, that's like in the first sentence, Heidi bopped her with subscript K on the head with a zucchini, there's no antecedent, that pronoun is fine. Or in the last sentence, Heidi said that she danced with art, that, that one has the um, K uh, index again, which means it's not co-referent with Heidi. Those are fine. And in the case where it is bound, they have to be bound in different clauses. So that's the third sentence. So Heidi and she are co-indexed, and, and Heidi does C command uh, she, but it so happens they're in different clauses. 
Again, this is almost exactly the opposite of what anaphores want. Anaphores need to have an antecedent, and that antecedent must be in the same clause. Here, pronouns don't really care if they have an antecedent, but if they do, they have to be in separate clauses. So let's try and capture that. The definitions here twist your mind a little bit. So once I go through them, hit the pause button and think about it a little bit, and maybe go back and sort of work through this. But it's worth, uh, it's worth taking your time to think about these, even though I'm going quite fast in this video. So the relevant notion for pronouns is to be free. And what does free mean? It means not bound. So um, what you want, if you're a pronoun, is not to be bound within your binding domain. So pronouns have to be free in their binding domain. Now they can be bound, right? That we saw that in the previous slide here in the sentence, Heidi said that she danced with art. The sh they can be co-indexed and, and C command. So they can be bound. They just can't be bound within their binding domain, within the clause that contains them. So that's what principle B says. Pronouns must be free in their binding domain. Um, no, principle B always refers to pronouns. Principle A always refers to anaphores. So let's break this down a little bit. Here's um, some trees that should be familiar to you from the uh, previous video, except we've replaced the anaphore with a pronoun. And what we have in the first sentence which is going to be unacceptable with the indexing shown, is um, we have the pronoun in the same clause as its antecedent. All right, let's run through the parts of figuring out whether this pronoun is free or bound and whether it's free or bound within its binding domain. So let's ask the question, is it co-indexed with something? Yes, it is. But that's not enough to make it bad, because sometimes co-indexing is okay. Is it C commanded by that thing? Yes, it is. So therefore, it's bound. Okay? So remember, pronouns want to be free within their binding domain. Now, is that antecedent in the same clause, so the same binding domain, as the pronoun? It's the first clause that contains the pronoun. Does it also include the um, R expression? And the answer to that is, is yes, the, 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 the antecedent is in the same clause as the pronoun, so that means it's, it's bound within its domain. So is it free in its domain? No, right? Pronouns want to be free. Anaphores want to be bound. So this is a violation of principle B and explains why that particular co-indexing is not permitted. Now let's contrast that with some situations where the pronoun is in a different clause. So I've marked with an arc here in the tree on the right the binding domain for the pronoun she. So remember what happens is the pronoun looks at the tree and sees, oh, there's a CP. So that's my binding domain. And we find that this, in this case, we have a co-indexation. Right? The noun phrase she is co-indexed with Heidi. They're, it, it, they are in a C command relationship. So that means they're bound. So the pronoun she is bound by Heidi. But is it bound within its domain? And the answer to that is no, it's not bound within its domain. It's free within its domain because the antecedent is on the other side of that curved line. So it's free in its domain and that means it meets principle B. Principle B says that pronouns must be free in their domain. Let's consider a few more cases here, this time with different indexing. Now these ones are going to be trivial because the indexing is different, so there's no bindings. But let's just run it to be sure. So you'll notice that Heidi has the index I, and that her and she have the index J, meaning they have different 
um, they have different reference. So are they co-indexed? No. And we can stop right there. It's not bound. So that means that that pronoun is free in its domain. It has no antecedent. That means it meets principle B. And the same is trivially true for the tree on the right-hand side. There is no co-indexing, which means they're not bound. Um, and that means it's going to be free in its domain. So in both cases, it meets the condition of principle B, that pronouns need to be free within their domain. This has been quite complicated, but let me give you an intuitive idea behind this. Think of it this way. Anaphores want to be bound in their domain. So anaphores like to be dependent upon someone else. They, they, they nourish cl close relationships. They want to be near the things that are their antecedents. Whereas pronouns are like teenagers. They want to be free from their parents. They want to be far away from their parents whenever they can. They want some kind of link to their parents, but if at all possible, they want to be free. Anaphores are like two-year-olds who, who need their parents. And pronouns are like teenagers who want a little bit of distance. And that's expressed in the difference between being bound within your domain and free within your domain. In the next unit, we're going to talk about our expressions.